an evaluation of seclusion and restraint reduction strategies within an acute mental health unit. Although seclusion and restraint practices are highly traumatic for people who require services, they are still widely used in New Zealand to manage those experiencing high levels of distress and or agitation within acute mental health inpatient units. In 2001, following concerns raised by service users, clinicians and researchers, the Mental Health Commission, with the support of the Ministry of Health, reviewed seclusion practices from a human rights, policy and practice perspective. Subsequently, a national plan to reduce seclusion and restraint use within New Zealand mental health services has been developed. As part of this plan, TAPO has recommended the use of the six core strategies for seclusion and restraint reduction published by America's National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. While the six core strategies have proven to be effective in North America, it is important that evidence is developed to support the use of this seclusion and restraint reduction program in the New Zealand context. Further information on the six core strategies can be found on the TAPO website. This video presents a retrospective evaluation of data collected from a New Zealand inpatient mental health unit before and after the six core strategies were implemented. The strategies provide a framework for organisational change within inpatient mental health services, specifically facilitating a shift away from seclusion and restraint use towards a more trauma-informed and recovery-oriented approach. The approach to organisational change is multifaceted and the framework can be used as a template and a monitoring tool for service culture change, including policy and procedure development, staff training and the implementation of specific strategies for managing service user distress and agitation. The strategies involve continuous monitoring and evaluation of the frequency and duration of time service users spend in seclusion and or restraint, including noting prevalence for particular behaviours during certain shifts or at particular times of the day. This data is then used as a measurement to provide goal-specific changes for improvement. Workforce development ensures that staff are competent in the delivery of trauma-informed care with a recovery focus and all policies, procedures and practices reflect an understanding of the broader contextual factors that impact service users. Additionally, staff are trained in the use of seclusion and restraint reduction tools for de-escalation, risk, self-management and comfort. This includes the use of a sensory room and sensory strategies. Consumer roles ensure that service users are involved in all decision-making processes at both individual and operational level, promoting full integration between clinical staff and service users. Lastly, debriefing techniques are used to inform policy, procedures and future practice and to provide an opportunity for staff, service users and witnesses to express any concerns. The aim of this study was to determine the effectiveness of the six core strategies in reducing the use of seclusion and restraint practices in a New Zealand acute mental health unit. This involved examining whether a significant reduction in seclusion and restraint rates occurred following the introduction of the six core strategy intervention. Retrospective clinical data was collated and classified into one year pre-intervention data and two years post-intervention data. Staff survey data was also reviewed to examine whether a shift in staff attitudes towards seclusion and restraint was evident from pre- to post-intervention. Additionally, the effectiveness of sensory modulation for distress reduction was evaluated using staff and service user ratings of arousal levels before and after the sensory intervention. The findings showed clear evidence of a reduction in the number of seclusion episodes post-intervention. Descriptive data measured the changes in the use of seclusion post-implementation of the six core strategy intervention. Pre-intervention, 172 seclusion episodes were recorded for the year. This number reduced to 46 episodes in the first year post-intervention, further reducing to just two episodes in the second year post-intervention. This resulted in the average annual seclusion rate per service user reducing from 40% to 9.8%, and 0.35% respectively, reflecting a significant drop in the rates of seclusion, with the practice being nearly eliminated completely in the second year post-intervention. The number of restraint episodes were measured annually pre to post-intervention. From the 83 restraint episodes, or 2.59 episodes per service user recorded pre-intervention, restraints nearly halved to 49 episodes, 
or 1.53 episodes per service user in the first year post-intervention. However, the number of restraint episodes increased to 74 episodes or 2.31 episodes per service user in the second year post-intervention. This increase could be attributed to many factors. Firstly, a large proportion of this trend can be attributed to one or two service users' multiple restraint episodes, which account for particularly high levels in March and April of the second year post-intervention. It was also hypothesised that the increase could be related to the challenge of maintaining organisational change over time, or the effects of new staff entering the service in the second year post-intervention. Results also showed that sensory modulation was found to be an effective tool, with service users from both the intensive care unit and open ward reporting significant reduced levels of distress. Preferred sensory modalities were identified, and these included the massage chair, a relaxation CD, weighted blanket, and lava lamp. The use of sensory modalities varied between the open and ICU wards. A reduction in the number of PRN medications administered was seen in the first year post-intervention. However, in a similar pattern to restraint use, an increasing trend was evident in the second year post-intervention. No clear trend was evident in staff attitudes over the period of the study, with staff reporting mixed feelings towards the use of seclusion. Whilst staff view that seclusion practices promoted a sense of safety, Staff also acknowledged that seclusion practices were punitive, non-therapeutic, and promoted feelings of guilt and disappointment when placing a person in seclusion. The findings suggest that the implementation of the six core strategies were effective in reducing seclusion and to a lesser extent restraint use in a New Zealand inpatient mental health setting. To ensure reduced levels of seclusion and restraint are sustained, in-depth education of new staff and ongoing education of existing staff is required. Ongoing opportunities for attitude exploration, education and practice development may also support a clearer shift in staff attitudes to seclusion and restraint. Whilst survey data clearly showed that staff agree that seclusion is not therapeutic, nearly half of the staff reported mixed feelings towards seclusion and restraint, believing that the practices are sometimes necessary for safety. For further information on the research design, refer to the research paper an evaluation of the efficacy of the six core strategies intervention to reduce seclusion and restraint episodes in an acute mental health unit, which can be found on the TAPO website.